kill the wicked. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. When I was six years old, our family moved from Burlington, Washington to a California suburb where my father had been sent to start a mission church. We soon discovered that a distant cousin of my mother just lived at the end of the block where our home was. I'll never forget the day that we were invited to her home for coffee and cookies. She was not the happiest of persons on God's green earth. She filled the stereotype of the stern school marm. It is a stereotype. When she asked my father's profession, he told her that he was a Lutheran pastor planting a mission in the western region of the Santa Clara Valley. I think we know that now as Silicon Valley. She snorted. She actually snorted and said, let me tell you, Martin Luther jumped, but he didn't jump far enough from the evils of Catholicism. (laughs) She went on to say that as a Southern Baptist, she knew that she was saved from hell and the devil. And then she announced that there was not enough preaching about hell and the devil in the churches of sunny California. Uh, How she could make that claim, I have no idea. (laughs) But to say the least, I was bewildered by this talk of hell and the devil. Apparently, my parents had failed to mention such things (laughs) in the prayer we recited at bedtime or in morning devotions from Christ in our home. Well, said my kind and diplomatic father, I'm sure you give thanks to God for the certainty of your salvation. Once we arrived home, he said something a little bit different. (laughs) He said, I think we see it just a little bit differently. That is, I think we're saved not so much from something but saved for something. Those three words, saved for something, have remained with me throughout my life. And you might imagine why, because they beg the question, saved for what? Salvation is an oft-used term among Christians in preaching, teaching, in hymns, and liturgical texts, a term used, I think, so frequently that it might just glide through our minds without much thought. Its Latin root, salvus, S-A-L-V-U-S, salvus, salvation, means wholeness and health. As in, the nurse applied the salve, S-A-L-V-E, to the wound. Could it be that salvation has less to do with escaping the pangs of hell and the devil and far more to do with receiving the blessing of wholeness and health of body, mind, and spirit from God's generous hands? In his understanding of the human condition, our brother Martin Luther taught that all humans are wounded All humans are wounded, and that this wound is the innate tendency to be turned in on themselves. To be turned in on themselves, a notion that can sound odd, if not offensive, to privileged Americans who think, you know, I'm 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 pretty good. I'm not wounded, I'm pretty good. The Latin term he used for this wound was incurvatus in se, curvatus, curved, catch it? The incurvatus, curved, 
being turned in on the self, suffering with a spiritual and psychological curvature so that one's vision of life is filled with the self and the needs and the desires of the self alone. Of course, such a tendency is aided and abetted and even approved in American culture. After all, scholars of culture suggest that we are now the most individualistic culture on the face of the earth and have been so since the 1950s. The problem with seeing only the self is that it becomes difficult to see others. And as Luther pointed out, to see one's creator, the community of the Holy Trinity. Of course, human beings can see other human beings. I can see you and you can see me standing here. The problem is this. If in my mind or imagination I see myself as the center of the universe, the shining, shining sun, so to speak, other people easily become planets circling around my orbit. Their purpose is to reflect my light or perhaps your light. Others then can easily become objectified. And that capacity to objectify is strongly among us these days. Directed at the immigrant, the houseless, the person who disagrees politically with you or me, the person of questionable sexuality, those challenged by poverty, the poorly educated. Seeing the other as a small planet whose purpose is to reflect one's light is, as we might imagine, the dream of every authoritarian leader. Whether that leader is a spouse, a boss, a teacher, a religious leader, or a public official, who expects loyalty to him or herself above all other qualities. Consequently, being curved inward makes it challenging to recognize other human beings as one equals, made in the image of God, and deserving at least of one's respect, if not one's love. My friends who are therapists, not because I go to therapy a lot, but my friends who are therapists <laughs> have a term for this condition, NPD, Narcissistic Personality Disorder, a condition that is alive to a greater degree and to a much lesser degree in every human being. That's a slightly sobering thought, yes. It should not surprise us then that Luther viewed God's grace not only as the unconditional favor God extends to all, but also as a healing power that begins the process of undoing the tendency to see oneself as the center of life, of the power of God's grace alive in the Christian, Luther wrote these words. This life is not righteousness, but growth in righteousness, not health, but healing, not being, but becoming, not rest, but exercise. We are not yet what we shall be, but we are growing toward it. The process is not yet finished, but it is going on. This is not the end, but it is the road to the end. All does not yet gleam in glory, but all is being purified. 
It should not surprise us then that Luther imagined the community we call the congregation as a hospital, as a therapeutic center in which the healing power of grace flows freely. Those who struggle with the wound of being curved inward can find healing here in the waters of the font, in the word of God proclaimed and interpreted, in the healing rituals of the church, in what Luther called the mutual conversation and consolation of the brothers and sisters, and certainly in one's communion, our communion in the body and blood of the Lord. No wonder then that early Christians referred to the communion as a medicine, as a remedy, as a salve, S-A-L-V-E, for the wounded soul, but also for the soul that can wound others. But there's more. In a short essay written in 1519 on the significance of the Holy Communion for Christian living, Luther wrote this. When you have partaken of the sacrament of the altar, your heart must go out in love and learn that this is a sacrament of love. As love and support are given you by Christ, you in turn are called to render love and support to Christ and his needy ones. You must feel with all the sorrow, the misery, and all the unjust suffering of the innocent with which the world is everywhere filled to overflowing. You must fight, work, and pray. If we think the promise of salvation as only an escape from hell and the devil, one might well wonder what our purpose, our vocation as Christians is in the world today. To this, Luther answers clearly, we are called to be agents of wholeness and healing in the world, in our families, in our relationships, in our workplaces, in public life. We have been saved for something. We have been saved by grace for something. We who have been grafted into the shoot that springs from the root of Jesse. We have been saved to live as witnesses to the one who does not disdain the poor, but judges them with compassion. The one who decides with equity for the oppressed of the earth. A number of weeks ago, I was leading a discussion of holy baptism at a Lutheran church in Tacoma. It will go unnamed. Toward the end of that discussion, a participant in the conversation made this comment and then asked a question. I wonder where we will be in the coming year with a new administration in Washington, D.C. As for me, he said, I'm fearful that we will continue to be engaged in two wars, in Ukraine and in the Middle East, and that immigrants and minorities in our country will suffer even more in the coming months. What are we to do, he said, an almost impossible question to answer. What are we to do? I responded by saying this, what do our baptismal promises ask of us? To proclaim Christ through word and deed. To care for others and the world God continues to create. And to work for justice and peace. Dear friends, as we anticipate the celebration of God becoming one with our flesh, one with the whole creation, it seems to me that we have been saved to lean into this work with greater thoughtfulness and energy, 
to live our lives as imperfect, imperfect incarnations of God's healing presence in our beautiful yet troubled world. Amen.